and welcome to this special interview and I am joined for this by none other than Mr John Neff. How are you John? I'm fine today. I'm happy in my retirement. That's wonderful. And we'll discuss what you've been doing in your lovely retirement shortly. And it's well earned, by the way. You've been in the business for, God, it must be 50 years, isn't it? Or more? 56 years in the studio. 56 I years. Made, I made my first record in August of 1965. Extraordinary. And you're running a young slip of a lad then when you John, you were 14, I think. Yes, right? I was 14. Yeah, young man, yeah. So was music always a big thing in at home, you know, when you were living at home as a kid? Was music always around you and stuff? But um, and were any of the family musical? My parents had a large console. Uh, it was mono, not stereo, uh, record player, RCA Victor, and uh, in a big mahogany cabinet with a 15-inch speaker. And it sounded wonderful. And my mother used to play classical music and Broadway shows, uh, all the Rodgers and Hammerstein shows and uh, all that stuff. And, um, and my dad liked trumpet players. So he had records by Bert Kempfert, who did Wonderland by Night, and um, uh, Harry James, who was a great trumpet player. David really liked him. And um, uh, so I was always around music. And my older brothers bought early rock and roll 45s. They were six and eight years older than me. So they were there at the beginning with Elvis and Chuck Berry. Yeah. By the birth of rock and roll, yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. 55, 56, wasn't it? Rock and roll really took off. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that that must that kind of music influenced you, I guess. Did it rock and roll and everything? Very heavily. Mm. Um, Chuck Berry was my first guitar idol, and I learned a lot from learning his records. Yeah. Uh, Chuck basically played horn arrangements on his guitar. He was trying to emulate horns. And that was all the double stops that he played. And um, uh, it was so interesting. It was so unlike any other guitar music of the day. I got my first guitar in 1961. Well, so, um, what was, the, what was the, the, the make of guitar that you first got? What was your first guitar? It was called a silver tone. Model 1448, I think, uh, uh, was a single pickup black metal flake sparkle guitar with an amplifier in the case. It had a five watt amplifier built into the guitar case. And that was my first guitar. I just sold it last year when I retired. Wow, you, had, you kept it all that time. Wow, that's amazing. All right. Yeah. That's extraordinary. All those years you kept that guitar. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I kept so much stuff. It was crazy when I retired. <laughs> I seem to remember how much stuff you had to get. You had an awful, you had, I think you had a, didn't you have a a, a, um, a, a lockup somewhere where you had a lot of stuff? You had tons of things, didn't you? You had to have them store a storage uh, place for them, I think. Is that right? No, it was. Mm. I had 2,500 square feet in the studio. And about a thousand of it was storage. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot. So, what do you kept out of those all those guitars, John? What maybe four or five of them now you've got? Or I, I sold forty-two. I kept five: one Les Paul, one Stratocaster, a custom one. Uh, my Martin acoustic guitar that I loaned to Willie Nelson and that he signed, a uh, Martin D41, and two basses, a Fender fretless jazz bass and a, uh, uh, what you call it, a uh, Spectre custom uh, bass that was built for me in 1985. 
Since then, I bought a 1961 reissue Gibson Red SG guitar, which I really love. So now I have six guitars. Nice. Yeah. And you still practice and still play in your time at home and stuff? Yes. I yeah. have a great little Fender Princeton Reverb amplifier from 1965 and uh, some pedals so I can get lead sounds and real good rhythm sounds. And uh, I play along with records and I've got two performance CDs that are minus one mixes. That's uh, some of my music, uh, four and five songs each CD uh, of my music without my vocal and without my lead guitar part. So it's, I used to use those in performance and uh, I would play live over the track. And so I have that to practice with too, to relearn my own songs. Yeah. Now, John, um, you work with an awful lot of people, not just David Lynch. I know you had a long association with Lynch, you know, nine years is a long time with one person, but you, you, you have an amazing um, uh, uh, history of working with some very big names. Um, Steppenwolf, I believe, is that right? You, you had some connection with? Yes, I played bass for Steppenwolf in 1977 and 1978. So you toured with them? Not on the record. Yeah. How was that, John? Did you enjoy that experience? Oh, yeah. Life on the road is tough. I had been on the road almost 10 years at that point, and it was sort of my last tour. I, 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 I was tired. Yeah. And then you had a you had you worked with Walter Becker, which is oh, quite yeah. interesting, of uh, Steely Dan. Um, how did yeah. that come about, John? How did you get to meet him and work with him? I used to do a radio show in the morning in Maui in the early 80s. I did it for nine years, almost all of the 80s. And one morning in April of 1982, Walter Becker came into the radio studio to shill for the whales. The Pacific Whale Foundation had sent him out to speak to radio stations about Whale Day, which is Earth Day in Hawaii. And he came into the radio studio. We did the show on the whales. And then uh, he asked to stay and he wanted to pick out records to play. So he sat on the floor of the radio studio handing me up albums and, and saying, play track three, side two, and things like that. And he stayed for the rest of my shift, picking the music, and we became friends. And uh, uh, in 1989, he came to my studio with a pickup truck load full of tapes of all the old Steely Dan outtakes and alternate mixes. And he wanted me to play them and record the ones that he and Donald selected to a DAT recorder, D-A-T, and a digital audio tape. And then destroy all the tapes. And uh, so I did that and he paid me for it through MCA Records. And then he came to me about two or three months later and he said, are you making any money here? And I said, yeah, I'm doing pretty well. I've got five albums in production. And he said, what would it take to close it down and build a real studio? And I went, well, gosh, let me finish these records and let's go ahead and do that. So we built a $2 million studio on the hill in Maui, overlooking the ocean. And um, uh, we recorded Donald Fagan's Comic Curiad record there, his solo album of 1993. And we recorded Walter's 11 tracks of Whack solo LP there. 
And uh, plus I did records with Willie Nelson, Buffy St. Marie, Sinead O'Connor and others uh, in the studio when Walter wasn't working there. So I had quite a, quite a wonderful time at that studio. Oh yeah. And then Walter bought me out in 93 and I moved back to the mainland. Wonderful time. Yeah. I've, I've recently, I was, I think I told you this, John, I recently went to see uh, one of the bands that I liked from the eighties, an English band called China Crisis. Oh yeah, and I learned that they um, well actually they they did two records that were produced by Walter Becker. They did one in called Flaunt the Imperfection in '85, and then they did the one in Maui for Di Diary of a Hollow Horse. That's the one where you came into it, you know, when they did it recorded in the studio there. Were you there when they were around, or did you did you actually work on the production of that? Or um... I did not. I did not work on that record. That was done at George Benson's Lahaina Sound in Lahaina, Maui, we did not have the studio open yet. Ah, right. So China Crisis was recorded elsewhere, but I supplied guitars to it. I supplied a Rickenbacker 12 string and uh, uh, Les Paul and other guitars uh, to the China Crisis ses sessions. Great stuff, yeah. Um... So it's just nice that there's a little connection there between you and, and them, which I thought was quite sweet, you know, uh, yeah. when I thought of that. Uh, uh, um, and uh, now, of course, um, when did you leave um, Maui to, to move to Los Angeles and, and, and sort of what, coming into the point where you met David? January, David of, January of 1993, I bought a house in Phoenix, Arizona and um, moved my family from Maui to Phoenix and uh, built a big studio there and it went under. The, there, it was too close to Los Angeles for a big studio. Everybody with any money went to LA. So the architect that designed the Maui studio and my Phoenix studio wanted to start a new company designing the infrastructure for studios, the wiring, the patch bay, the console, all the outboard gear, the speakers, all that, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then install them. Well, they came to me to found that company. So I did. I moved to Los Angeles in 95 and uh, started Tectone Engineering and we designed the technical details of studios all over the world. David Lynch was my client there. That's how I met him. Uh -huh. So at what point, John, did you uh, kind of like connect with him and start and, and, uh, and him saying, oh, would you like to work with me on, on a project or something like that? Well, he didn't have anybody to supply the equipment for his studio that he was that we were building uh in the old madison house uh from lost highway that became the studio um so uh he needed a 22 foot screen all the big speakers behind it for cinema uh, projectors. Uh, he already had a console, a Euphonics 56 channel, and uh, he needed all the outboard gear, other recorders, Pro Tools, uh, near field monitors, projectors, and um, so I supplied all that and installed all that so that the studio would run. Uh-huh. And what's the first uh, sort of like a, a major thing that you worked on? Was it, would it have been uh, um, uh, uh, the straight story? In no. Terms of, no. No. Um, I mixed a Honda Passport commercial for David in 1997 before the studio was done. I did Foley on it and, uh, and mixed it for broadcast. 
in stereo and it ran for nine months on the air. It was a Honda Passport commercial with no words. It was all music and sound effects. And then after that, he hired me to run the studio. He said, you're the only one that knows how this thing works. You're going to have to run it. And I laughed and I said, David, I can't afford to pay cut. And I was making about 100,000 a year then. And uh, so he came to me with a better offer and I came down about 25% and we made a deal and I went to work for, I quit the company I founded and went to work for David. Uh, and the first thing we did was Jocelyn Montgomery's album, Lux Vivens. Are you familiar with that? Um, sort of. I, I think I saw. Um, I think there was a, uh, um, a a little making of of that film on YouTube somewhere, and they were interviewed at the time. Yeah. And they were talking to to her and uh, uh, and David, and uh, I remember a little bit about that, the sort of like behind the scenes of it, which is quite interesting. Yeah. Um, she had a, a incredible voice. Yes, she and, did. And I think and she was playing, was she playing violin as well on there? Or yes, the she was. Yeah, yeah. On some of the songs, not all of the songs. Uh, we no. didn't want it on all of them. But um, so that was the first project I did with David once I was running the studio. And uh, it was David's first experiments on the guitar. David's daughter's uh, man friend was the road manager for Slayer. And oh, yeah, he yeah. brought over a big Marshall amp and this hot rod purple guitar with a whammy bar for David to use on Jocelyn's record. And so on Sapientia, the very first opening number of the record, David is playing this dark, evil uh, dive bomb guitar, and uh, it sets the mood for the whole record. It's, it just, it almost scares you, it's so good. Was Angelo involved in that, Angelo Badalamenti? No. Ah. I did all the musical arrangements, and I performed a, a lot of the music tracks I think I have 22 credits on that album. It's crazy. Wow. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah. That's an awful lot for one album, yeah. Um, but you did, go, you did work with Angelo on uh, The Straight Story, didn't you? I think you went to Prague, uh, where they did the orchestra parts. Um, no, but the we recorded The Straight Story at David's studio. We had 14 string players and three guitar players. The three guitar players were in isolation booths in the studio and the 14 string players were between the console and the screen. And we recorded the score for the straight story in a 12 hour session on January 30th, 1999. It's very impressive how you remember dates, John. I can't remember what happened last week. You know, oh, well, it just sticks with me. Yeah, incredible that. Yeah, your knowledge. <laughs> um, there was a there was a period where it, where we in I think it was two thousand and one or so. You had so many different projects going on with David. Um, you had the of course with davidlinks.com that we mentioned, uh, which is a very early experimental uh, thing that you did on the online, um, and also. Uh, working on Mulholland Drive and the Blue Bob album as well. There was an awful lot happening around that time. Um, with, uh, what's your sort of uh, thoughts on that, John? Um, uh, uh, I, I, I suppose you know the chronological kind of order of this, but um, better than I would. But uh, uh, was, was it the davidlinks.com that kind of came first and then the other things kind of followed that? Right after we finished Jocelyn's album, in April of 1998, uh, David wanted, he loved the guitar 
He already had two new guitars of his own, vintage guitars, and I gave him a couple of amplifiers and he wanted to continue making music. So we started the experiments that became Blue Bob in April of 98. And we worked on that until the fall when he left to shoot the straight story. I did not go on the road with him. I stayed home and I wrote two or three more Blue Bob songs while he was shooting the movie. Yeah. And then, uh, like I said, in January of 1999, we recorded the score and then we immediately started the film mix for the straight story, which was my very first feature film mix, my first uh, 5.1 surround mix, and it had been my first orchestral score recording. So the straight story was a whole new immersion for me into the world of film that I had never been in. I had made some quad records in the 70s. That's four channels, left, right, front, and left, right, sur uh, rear, surround. Uh, but so I knew how to play with the back speakers a bit, but David didn't want me to do too much back there. He wanted it to play on the screen. So other than driving a car through the theater, which I did uh, in the soundtrack, I was not able to do a whole lot in the surrounds on that picture, except for atmospheres. And David and I created some wonderful atmospheres for that movie that just played lightly in the background. And it just made the whole movie sing. It was so much fun. That's beautiful. Um, you did, um, you did, of course, um, go, uh, go out on location for, um, location sound recording for Inland Empire though, didn't you? You were actually out there. I did all the location sound for davidlynch.com and all the little series that we put on there. And the first two things we recorded for Inland Empire were meant for the website. So yes, I did the location sound for Laura's big monologue, which is cut up through the movie. And, uh, uh, and I worked a year and a half on Inland Empire doing location sound the biggest one was the barbecue scene where I had eight lavalier mics on the Polish circus performers and two booms on Laura and uh, uh, her supposed husband. And so I was printing 10 tracks of audio for that scene. Hmm. Also, you worked with, you worked with Laura, uh, Laura, uh, uh, um, uh, yeah, not Laura, what am I talking about? Um, Naomi Watts, uh, not just, you worked on, on a music video with her, didn't you, called um, Thank You Judge, which is one of the Blue Bob songs, which I yeah. thought was a very funny video. It was very amusing. Um, where was that shot, John? What, what's your, what, what do you remember about doing that video? Well, uh, the shots of all the items I lost in my divorces were staged. And then David rented a house in the valley and we went out and shot the uh, scenes where she's throwing my stuff out on the lawn and the cops are there and David is there in the mask. That's him in the mask on the, on the video, by yeah, the way. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, he made the mask. And, um, and then we went to a, uh, a CD motel on Van Nuys Boulevard and shot there for my new home. And, uh, and then David rented a courtroom set and hired actors and Naomi played my ex-wife and she was just brilliant in the courtroom scene. She, she was, was calling me the MF word and all kinds of things. <laughs> 
but she really got into it and she played my ex-wife very well she did a great job yeah <laughs> she was really angry with you <laughs> yeah i remember that very well she's screaming over that i know you can't hear it but you can see her emoting in the courtroom oh yeah <laughs> and that was very funny um and uh, uh um can you tell us just brief, a little bit just a little bit how you got to know uh, rebecca del rio and christabel because you, you work with both of those people who have been of course associated with david a lot um how did you come come to meet them was it through david or what? had you known them previously i did not know either one previously brian locks from caa creative artist agency brought rebecca to meet David in, oh my goodness, I'm going to say December of 1998. And uh, she had just done a country album in Nashville for uh, Giant Records for uh, Irving Azoff. And it wasn't out. Irving didn't release it. So she came to LA looking for work or looking for an opening. And Brian brought her by the studio to meet David just for the heck of it. Well, David said within 10 minutes of meeting her, we all had coffees and had hardly had any coffee. And David said to her, I hear you're a singer. Why don't you sing something? She stood up in the theater and started singing Gerondo. And he stopped her and said, no, down there. And pointed to the vocal booth in the studio where I had set up a microphone with a tube preamp, a nice digital reverb and uh, echo. And uh, uh, so she went down there, went into headphones she loved the sound of her voice like that. And she sang Gerondo. I recorded it. And that's what you hear in the film. Because of that, David is a big Roy Orbison fan and produced Roy's last record. And um, because of that, he wrote her into the film for the whole Club Silencio sequence. Which was amazing, by the way. And the fact that that, that track was the what she did on that was actually the, the track that was recorded, wasn't it? It was the, yes. the, the vocal, the, the isolated vocal. Yeah. Yes. Which is incredible. And uh, I've heard her sing that since, uh, John, at uh, uh, um, the uh, now defunct, sadly, Twin Peaks Festival in London. Oh, um, yeah. When Rebecca came over, and uh, so did Christabel as well, uh, which brings me on to her in a second. They both performed at the festival. And uh, it was incredible to hear hear it sung live, you know. And she's lost none of her chops by any means. Oh, I know. Amazing. Rebecca is wonderful. I did two nights with her in October at the Hollywood Theater, a big old 1929 Grand Theater here in Portland. They ran a 35 millimeter print of uh, Mulholland Drive. And then afterwards, she did a small concert and we played no stars together uh two nights in a row it was beautiful that's lovely yeah that's great and also christabel too you, uh, you had some involvement with her first album didn't you this train i believe you, you worked on the, some, some of that stuff i have four songs on that album yeah i wrote the music performed recorded and mixed it uh krista was a project that david was interested in right after Rebecca Del Rio. And um, we did those songs and they have quite a mood. And one of the songs from this train, Real Love, was used in a Christian Dior television commercial in Europe. And the money from that allowed me to build my Portland studio. Krista is directly responsible for my last studio. Yeah. That's awesome. And that was the studio you worked in until you retired? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And you still live in Portland, don't you, John? Yes. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. 
So, John, we're near the end, the end of the interview now. I just want to thank you very much for your time. Sorry if it seemed rushed, but uh, um, I'm, I'm, you know, we, we took a bit longer to get to get this sorted out than I anticipated, you know. But um, uh, I'm very grateful to you, John, for taking the time to talk to me. Thank you, Frank. And um, we'll see you guys very soon. I hope you enjoyed this. And we'll be back with some more um, interviews of, uh, of different people very soon. And uh, some more film reviews as well. So until, until then, guys, take care and thank you.